cancer of the bo- all the cancer of the land upon his body and let it eat him that everybody could be free from cancer for all eternity. Now, that's just a small example, but we could understand, imagine the pain that he would go through to have all that cancer eating in his body. His body would be nothing but cancer. And that's what Christ did. He took all of our sins upon his back and he became sin for us. In other words, he was eaten alive by sin. And he said, Father, it is finished. And he took it to, he took it to the grave. He took it to hell itself and says, Devil, here's this nasty, ugly thing that you planted in the hearts and the minds of men, women, boys, and girls. And I'm giving it back to you, devil. And I'm giving you back with interest. And that's what the, Jesus did. He gave sin back to the devil and he put it in his face and says, Take back that nasty, vile thing which you created. And that's what Christ wants to do. He wants to take sin out of your heart and your mind. He wants to rip it. He wants to tear it. He wants to annihilate it and give it back to where it came from. Jesus doesn't want cancer in your body. He doesn't want sin eating your heart, your mind, your emotions, your will, your desires. He doesn't want it eating your dreams and everything that you have and are because that's what sin will do. It will eat your heart. It will eat your mind. It will eat your emotions. It will eat your past, your present, your future to where you're always stuck in the past, your present to where you can't step forward, and your future to where all you can do is look at what has gone in the past to where you have no hope, no future. That is what sin does, whether it be anger, to where you can't forgive somebody, whether it be bitterness and it eats away at you, whether it grabs from you and it takes to your family members and all of a sudden you've got a whole family bitter at somebody that nobody can remember why they're bitter at that person, but they're angry, they're mad, they're upset, they have no hope, they have no joy because sin is eating at their heart, their very soul and mind. And that's why there is such a thing called hell because sin is the most wicked, vilest, polluted, corrupt thing there is and it eats and it burns, and it destroys everything it touches. And we can see that. If you can see Stalin, 50 million people murdered. Hitler, 6 million people murdered. You can see all the greatest atrocities in the human race, and it comes from one thing, sin. It all comes from a disobedience to God to where they said, devil, we're going to listen to you, and we're going to take your heart, your seed, your planting in our heart, and we're going to produce fruit after your kind. And that is the law of Genesis. We produce after seed, after you produce fruit, after the seed that's planted in the ground or, you know, or in an animal or any human being. And we had sin. We had the double seed planted in our heart and our mind. And Jesus came to destroy it, to rip it out, to annihilate it. Hell is there to take this wicked, vile thing because God made us eternal. He cannot, he will not destroy us because that's not who God is. But he has to put that sin And if you become one with sin, God wants to become one with you. He wants to become one with his love, his kindness, his gentleness, his purity, his long-suffering, his forgiveness, his joy, his hope. Everything that God is, he wants to become one with you. That's what Jesus said. He said, Father, that they may become one even as we are one. But the devil wants to become one with you. He wants you to be a liar just like him. He wants you to be hateful just like him. He wants you to be a murderer just like him. He wants you to be vile and corrupt just like him. He wants you to be a liar just like him. He wants you to be a thief just like him. He wants you to to be self-centered and self-pleasing and self-loving, just like him. And God says, I can't have that in heaven because that is the most wickedest, vile thing you can imagine. It creates diseases. It creates all these things. If you can look at one thing in life and say, man, that is vile, that is corrupt. Think of sin as a million times worse because it is the cause of it. You look at people losing their hair. You see them going through all this trouble. They turn yellow because of cancer. They, you know, they get sick. And you, you don't hate the symptoms, even though you're ashamed, you're, you're, you feel pity for them, you weep for them because of the symptoms, what they're going through, how unhealthy they look. But what you hate is the cancer that's eating away at their body. And that's what we are supposed to hate. We're supposed to hate sin because it kills, because it causes diseases, because it does all these things. And because our Savior, Jesus Christ, had to give his very soul for the cure of sin. And that's why we're supposed to hate it and abhor it with all we have and are. And that's what Christ came to came. He says, I came to save my people from their sin. I came to heal them, cleanse them, deliver them, make them whole. And that is the salvation that Jesus Christ paid the price for, that you might be saved to the uttermost. Not that you might be halfway, partway, only a little way, or most of the way. That you might have joy abundantly, that you may have peace that passes all understanding, that you may have a faith 
that overcomes everything, that you may have a thankful, grateful heart, that you may have life and life more abundantly. That's why Christ came, and that's why Jesus is my life. That's why Jesus is supposed to be your life. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, if you now have newness of life in him, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things in the earth. Love Christ, love that which is right, love that which is his nature and his character. Love that see other people saved, healed, and delivered and brought to him. Set your love, set your hope, set your desires on Christ. Set your desires and your affections on what he loves. A good marriage, they love what they, they both are become one. And they love what... They love each other, but they also love what the other person loves, and that person loves what you love, and that's what Christ came to be. He became, became one with us where we love and desire the same things, where we hope in the same things, we take joy in the same things, where we, you know, it says all heaven rejoiced when one sinner repenteth, when one sinner is healed and delivered from sin, and that's what our heart and our mind are supposed to be crying out. Lord, help us, deliver us to where we love you and where we love to see other people, where we're not caught up in the things of this world, where our affections, our desires are not on things that are going to pass away, to where we don't love our television so much we're sitting in front of it hours of a day when somebody's out there taking drugs or committing suicide, or where we're reading or doing things that aren't meaningful, or when we're caught up in worldly things or politics or finances, things that are going to pass away that... A year later, you might lose all your money because the stock market crashed again. Or all these things that don't mean a hill of beans, they're worth than worthless. You might need some of, you know, might need money to take care of yourself. But Jesus said, seek those things which are above. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God knows what you need. He'll take care of you. Our affections are supposed to be on him. Our affections are supposed to be on what he said. Our affections are supposed to be on his heart and his mind cry, which was, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They're blind, they're naked, they're destitute, they're poor. They've been blinded, they've been corrupted, they're sick, Lord. Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And my dad says it means it's sick. The flesh, the sinful nature is sick. It does things, it corrupts things, it, it destroys our dreams and our hopes. It destroys everything we have and everything we can be. If you see somebody in jail and they've been there for 50 years, sin destroyed their life. If you see somebody who ends up taking, committing suicide, sin destroyed their life. That is what sin does. That is the whole thing that sin is. It isn't some little pet thing that we can, you know, pet and take care of. You know, you hear stories about people who raise these dangerous animals, and when it's young and it seems cute, it seems wonderful, and all of a sudden it grows up, and all of a sudden the owner of that pet is killed by it. And that's what sin is. It is a wicked, vile thing that might seem harmless until it grows up and takes your life. It takes your family. It takes your heart. It takes your mind. And that is what Christ came to destroy. And that's why we live, move, and have our being in him. He is our life. He is our life savior. He is our healer. He is our deliverer. He is our hope. He is our peace. He is our joy. Without him, we have no life. He says, for ye, he said, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. He says, you've been set free dead to the old, that you may have a newness of life. He says, when Christ, who is our life, my life, your life, shall appear, then shall ye appear with him in glory. If Christ is your life, when he appear, then you will appear with him in glory. But if you made something else your life, it doesn't matter what it is, money, wealth, uh, perversion, foolish entertainment, things of this world, or even another person. If something else is your life, then Christ can't heal you because you, you know, it's... My dad has a, a thing called a brain parasite, and he says how sin is the brain parasite, and it corrupts and destroys, and the only way to cure is Jesus, straight to the heart, straight to the mind, his blood, his word, his spirit. Without that, this sin, this vile parasite, it cannot be killed by anything else but by Jesus Christ. It cannot be killed by anything else but by his word and his spirit. That's why Jesus says, forsake not the assembly of yourself. It says, if you continue in my word night and day, then you will be my disciples indeed. He says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that's why Jesus says, you've got to abide in me, and I've got to abide in you, because without these things, you will be destroyed, you will burn, you will... 
The devil will corrupt you. The devil is like a roaring lion seeking to invade the bower. He's a thief who's always looking to get over the wall. If you let your wall be broken down, if you're not in Christ and Christ is not in you, then the devil will sneak in and kill you and annihilate you and destroy you. I don't care if you call yourself a Christian. I don't care if you've been saved 50 years. I don't care if you're new, newly saved. Christ is your life. The devil has one thing he has on his mind. He wants to get you separated from the good shepherd. He wants to get you separated from your king. He wants to get you separated from your Lord, your master, your friend, your protector, your hope and your joy. And that's why people walk around like they're dead. That's why they have no hope, have no joy. Because Christ isn't their hope. Christ isn't their joy. Their hope is in their job. Their joy is in something else. Their, their fulfillment is in the lust of the world. Their life isn't in God, isn't in Jesus Christ. It's in something else. And he says, then shall you appear with them in glory. Romans 3, says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. He says our salvation, our newness of life, our righteousness, our grace, our obedience, our new nature is in Jesus Christ, is by having faith in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 13, 4 through 5 says, for though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. He says, you can look at Christ and says that, you know, you could see it as a sign of weakness, that he allowed himself to be hurt, that he allowed himself to die upon that cross. But he says he was living by the power of God. He was resurrected in newness of life through the power of God. He says, for we also are weak in him. He says, we take upon him, ourselves the weakness of Christ, which is that he laid his life down for us. So we lay our life down for him and for others. We take upon that same weakness. It says when we weak, then we are strong. We need to come to a realization that we are weak without him, that we can do nothing without him. But at the same time, we revel in it. We, we glory in our weakness in the sense of saying, Lord, it's not me, it's you. You saved me. You healed me. You delivered me. You are my life. You are my hope. You are my faith. You are my confidence. And he says, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith, whether your faith and hope and life be in Christ. He says, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? He says, know ye not that Christ lives, moves, and has his being in you, that he is your heart, he is your mind, he is your life? But if he isn't, then you're not right with God. He says, you're a reprobate. In other words, you're lost. Because without Christ, you have no life. And, you know... He says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. He says, if you don't, you have no life in you. And at that time, most of the disciples that followed Christ says, they said, this is too hard. And they walked away from him because they thought the rest of the world had meaning. They thought they could get life out of other things. They thought, well, this is too hard to give up this. They didn't have a revelation that the rest of it was going to burn, that it was temporary. It had no meaning. They had the opportunity to follow Christ, Jesus, in the flesh, for all the time he was on this earth to hear his word, to see him do miracles, they had a chance to live and move and abide with him in the actual physical reality. And because Christ says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, because Christ says, you've got to give all, they walked away. And he says, most of them never again walked with Christ. Why? Because they were blinded by the world, they were blinded by the flesh, they were blinded by the devil, they bought the lie that they needed part of the world and they could have part Christ. That Christ wasn't enough for them. Christ is enough for you. I don't care what the devil says. I don't care how the flesh screams. I don't care what the emotions say. I don't care what your past, present, or what might happen to you in the future. Christ is enough for you. Do not listen to the world. Do not listen to the flesh. Do not listen to the devil. Jesus Christ is enough for you. He is the author and the finisher and the beginning and the middle and the end of your faith. He is enough for you. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. The price he paid, I pay together with him gladly because he bore much more than I could ever bear. I want to know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of suffering. I just want to suffer together with him. I want to know who he is. He says, nevertheless, I live. He says, I'm alive. I'm, I'm a man. He says, a newness of life I've never felt before. But Christ lives, he says, but it's not me. He says, but it's Christ liveth in me. Christ lives in me. And he says, in the life which I now live in this carnal flesh, he says, I live by the faith of the Son of Jesus. 
I live by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, I live by Jesus Christ. I live by trusting, hoping, and relying, and having faith in Jesus Christ. He loved me, and he gave himself for me. And he said, Lord, you love me, and you gave yourself for me. So by your mercy and by your grace, I love you, and I give myself in return. And it's the least I can do. It is... It, you, you offer me eternity. You offer me your kingdom. You offer me all that you are. And all that you ask is I love you in return. All you ask is that I realize that the things of this world are temporary. All you ask is that I don't corrupt myself, pollute myself, cause my own destruction. Thank, oh, Lord, that's an awesome deal. Thank you for such a wonderful, incredible deal. Thank you, Lord, for freeing me from sin, for showing me that none of this stuff matters. Thank you, Lord, for offering me everything, for almost nothing. All you want is for me to say, I don't want to be a friend of your enemy, Jesus. I don't want to love the devil. I don't want to love the things of this world. I don't want to love sin, but I want to love you. That's all Christ asks, is that we don't corrupt ourselves and pollute ourselves with what he had to give his life to free us from. That's what Christ asks us for, to love him in return and give ourselves in return. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17 says, For the love of God or Christ constrains us. It says, Lord, the love you showed upon that cross, it burns in my heart, it burns in my mind, it burns in my very body, and I don't want to do those things which are wrong. I won't, it, 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 you know, it pulls me back from the edge, it pulls me back from destruction. It says, Lord, you paid your, your very blood to free me from this, to deliver from me, to set me free. Why would I want to partake of it? And it says, Lord, this stuff has no right in my life because you bought me with your blood. That's, you know, it says that Christ, you know, that we look unto him, the author and finisher of our faith, that we look to him who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and spies in the shame. He says, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Jesus had to resist unto sweating blood because he had to go to the cross, because he had to take your sins, my sins, all the world's sins upon his back. He had to push himself to the point where he was nigh unto death, even before he had to, got arrested, even before he was whipped, even before he was crucified, even before he had to stay on their hours bearing our sickness, even before he went to hell for us. He says, we cannot imagine the pain, we cannot imagine the pressure he was under, you know, have you ever felt shamed? Have you ever felt under a conviction? Have you ever felt really bad for something you did? And it was like you felt like you were almost bent over backwards because of what you said and what you'd done? Imagine that a trillion times over on Christ. And he had to resist that temptation to say, Lord, I can't do this. I can't do your will. It's too much. He even had to ask the Father, he says, if there is any other way, it doesn't mean that you won't struggle with sin, but he, he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, if there's any other way, but he says, if there isn't, then I'll do it. And he had to do that three times, and he sweated drops of blood, and that's what we're called to. We're called to resist sin, even unto death, the death of the cross. We're called to give our will, our life for God. Jesus, you know, the Father loved Jesus to the point of saying, I'm going to share my heart, my mind, my will to you, which is to save the people from their sins, which is to go to the cross and pay the ultimate price. And Jesus says, as the Father loved me, so have I loved you. The same love the Father loved me, the shared the heart, the mind, that became a team to go to the cross together, to set people away from, save them from their sin, to deliver them, to heal them, to set them free. He says, now I'm sharing that same heart, that same mind, that same will, that same desire with you. That very part of me, he says, as my father and I were one, he says, now I want to become one with you, and I want you to have the same heart and mind. He says, this is an honor. If you, know, if you knew some great hero or some great uh, a person in history, the same person who's still alive, and they said, I want you to come aside me. I want you to be a part of what I'm doing. I want you to be part of this great battle I'm fighting against evil. But you have to be right there with me. You have to be willing to go through what I go through. You have to be willing to fight right beside me. That would be an honor. And with Christ, it's more than an honor. It's, it's an eternal reward. It's an awesome, incredible thing. And that's what Christ asks us for, to go through what he went through to be there right with him, to be one with him, to have his heart and his mind. He says, because we thus judge, if one died for all, then we're all dead. He says, let's, let's break it down straight to the truth. He says, if Christ, one died for all, then we've got to realize that all were dead without that sacrifice. 
He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He says, dying ye shall die. You know, the anger was eating away with you. The bitterness was angry with you. All these things were eating at you. You were dead. You were dying. And we can see it in people around us. They're, they're wrapped up in sin. They're wrapped up in drugs. They're wrapped up in the world. And you can see the death that is, they're dying. It is killing them. And that is what sin does. And he says, if Christ died for us, then we realize we were already dead. If we were already dead without Christ, why do we try to be halfway zombies? Why do we say, Lord, you resurrected me from the dead, but I'm going to go back and I'm going to infest myself with death again. I'm going to try to be halfway alive, halfway dead. How dumb is that? How foolish is that? How utterly ridiculous is that? And that is what sin is. We're saying, God, you set me free from the seed of the enemy. You set me free from death itself, and I want the seed of death. I want the seed of hell. I want to be just like the devil. That's what we're saying when we sin. And that's why it says, if you sin, you have an advocate with Christ Jesus the Father. Say, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. And he'll cleanse you. He'll set you free. Jesus isn't just somebody who says, well, I'll cover it over with the blood. I'll cover over the symptoms of that disease. He says, no, I will annihilate that disease. If you come to me, he says, I am loving. I am kind. I am merciful. I will kill that seed again. I will destroy it. I will set you free from it. And that is what Christ has come to do. He's come to set us free, annihilate sin, to make us whole, to make us pure, to make us a new person, to where we're kind, gentle, where nothing can affect us. That's why people could burn at the stake and say, Father, forgive them. That's why they could sing praises to God. That's why they were so incredible, so awesome, so different from everybody else. They were, you know, you hear people say, talking about utopia and how everybody would be kind, and if you could do it away with this. Well, that's what Christ wants to do. He wants to form utopia in your heart to where you will love and you will be forgiving and you will be kind and gentle to where you will be just like Jesus Christ was, where you're willing to tell people the truth because you love them and you want to see them set free from that thing which is killing them. If somebody is eating something and it's laced with arsenic, if you love that person, you have any compassion in your heart, you will tell them, don't eat that. It'll kill you. And if you don't, then you don't love that person. And that is what we're called to. We're called to love people and say, you're dying. The devil is killing you. You might not realize it. You might be under the illusion that it's good for you, that it's healthful. But you say, it will kill you. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to love people to the extent of saying, we want you to be healed. We want you to be saved. We want you to be delivered. We want you to be set free from the devil who was trying to annihilate you. He says, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. He says, we were dead, but Christ gave his life for us. We are no longer supposed to be living for ourselves. We are no longer supposed to be living to where we kill ourselves. But we are now supposed to be living for Jesus Christ. He says, wherefore, henceforth know we no man at the flesh. He says, we don't go by the flesh anymore. He says, yet though now we, we have known Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth know we no more. He says, we don't even know Christ in the flesh. He's now in heaven, but he's left us his word. He's left us his spirit to where we know in him we are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. To where he'll lead us and guide us to where he, we have this life, this fire burning in our heart and our mind. And he says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, if he lives in Christ, dwells in Christ, Christ lives in him to where Christ is his life, then he is a new creature because you will be possessed, consumed, and driven by something. It'll either be Christ or the devil. And the devil isn't always obvious. Because, you know, it's uh, a movie, a game, uh, a job. Things that don't seem as har harmful or as obvious. But they're, they come from the devil. They come from the world. They come from the flesh. They are just a cuter offspring of a vile, deadly creature that will destroy us. And Jesus says, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against your soul. The devil has weapons. Just like Jesus said, he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly or carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination, every high thing that exalts itself against a God, and bringing thought every captive to the obedience of God. But the devil has weapons too. Vain vanity, carnality, foolishness, anger, bitterness, uh, not coming to church, he has weapons too. Distractions, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. He has weapons too. And these things are little feelers, little roots, little, little traps that he puts in front of us that he says, 
I don't really care how I get you, but once I get you, I'm not satisfied with a little bit. I'm going to take you for all you are. And that's what the devil does. He puts out all these little feelers, and all of a sudden they grab a hold of us like leeches. And then they start, then they go into our body, and they're like parasites, and they start multiplying. And that's what the blood of Christ is. It will annihilate those leeches, those vile things that will destroy your life. But you've got to give them your life. You've got to give them who you are. Christ will set you free. Christ will deliver you. But the devil wants to destroy you. He's like a roaring lion, soaking him to be made of power. He is the father of lies. He's the father of murder. He will kill you if you allow him to. He says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He's been set free from sin. He says that old, vile nature has been passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Holy and pure and peace and joy and kindness and gentleness. First Thessalonians 5, 5 through 11 says, Ye are all the children of light. He says, You are now the children of God and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. We are not of the devil nor of his devices nor of his sin. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Let us not be wild and connived and dece deceived into sleeping in being, uh, being captured, you know, in Pilgrim's Progress, there's a story about these people who laid down beside the pathway, and the devil came along, and he tied them up with ropes and with nets. And Pilgrim came along, Christian came along, and he tried to wake them up. They were on the path, but they fell asleep, and they got tied up with the world, and tied up by the devil. And, you know, the Christian came along, and he tried to wake them up, and they wouldn't wake up because they were asleep. He says, we are not supposed to be asleep. He says, awake thou to sleep. It's an arise from the dead. The sleep is causing, coughing about death, of uh, uh, being taken by the enemy, of uh, being corrupted and destroyed by sin. And he says, awake thou to sleep. It's an arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, or seriously, soberly, consideringly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And being not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, that we know Christ is our life, that he is our, our hope and our joy, that he is our everything. He says, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. He says, if you sleep, you sleep in darkness. If you're drunken in the things of this world, if you, your world, you're getting your fulfillment from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. If you're loving the world and things that are in the world, if the world is your fulfillment, you know, it's entertainment's your fulfillment, it's jobs are your fulfillment, it's friendships are your fulfillment, it's fears and and worries are your fulfillment. Then he says, you are drunken, you are consumed, you are possessed by darkness itself. And he says, but let us who of the day be sober, be serious, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And for a helmet, a hope of salvation. He says, let us put on a faith and a love for Jesus. He said, let us put in a hope of deliverance from sin itself, a hope in Jesus Christ. He says, for God hath not appointed us to wrath. He's not appointed us to be destroyed by sin, to be captured by the devil, but to obtain salvation or deliverance by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we live or die, wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Whether we're alive in this world, we should live together with Christ. Christ is our life. We live together with him. And that's why you could say, look at a person and say they're a Christian, they're Christ-like. Because Christ is their life, and Christ lives in them, and they live in Christ, and there's a oneness. They love what the other loves. They, they desire what the other desires. They hope what the other desires. They rejoice in what the other desires. And he says, or whether they be dead, they're already, they, you know, now they're living with him in the physical. Now they're with him for all eternity. He says, wherefore, comfort yourself together, edify one another, even as also you do. He says, comfort yourself in loving God and abiding in Christ, and Christ abiding in you, that Christ is your very soul, your very reason for living. Colossians 1.4 says, Since we heard of your faith or trust or hope or confidence or reliance in Christ Jesus and the love which you have all the saints, and that's what loving God does. It leads to loving others. It, because he says, if you don't love those people you can see, how can you love God whom you can't see? He says, you're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself. So if you don't love your neighbor, you don't love your brother and sister in Christ, says, well, my love for God must not be great enough because I can't love my neighbor. I can't love that person in the church who's annoying as all get out. I can't love others. Well, then you need to get on your face before God. Then you need to read the word and say, Lord, forgive me for not loving others. My love for you must not be enough. You must not be in me enough. I must not have given you enough of me. I need to read your word, meditate on your word, that I might be your disciple indeed, that I might be set free of this, this 
this impatience, this bitterness, this anger towards this person, that I may love you and love them. And he says, they shall know you are my disciples, or they will know that you love me because of your love for one another. And that's why we don't have a love for each other, because our love for Christ isn't as strong as we think it is. Our love in Christ is not consumed, possessed. It is in our, Christ is in our life though, to the extent he's supposed to be. But we're trying to find life in other things, or we don't know that Christ is supposed to be our everything. It says, you know, I'm going to get to it later. It says, Root, Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, rooted and grounded in love. In other words, that Christ may dwell, that you may be rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ and the love he showed for you and a love in return that will be filled with all the fullness of God that will have his nature and will love others. Ephesians 3, 16 to 21 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that he would strengthen you with his grace, with his power, with his quickening, with all that he is by his spirit in the inner man, for what reason would he strengthen you? What reason will he power you? What reason will he say you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What reason will he do this? That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. That Christ may live in you, abide in you, remain in you. That you may live and abide and remain in him that ye being rooted and grounded in the love that Christ showed you and loving him in return, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, that you may have an understanding of who Christ is, what his word means, who he is, and what he desires, and to know the love of Christ, that you may have a true revelation of the price that Christ paid upon that cross. He says, he who has been forgiven of much loveth much. And it's not that we have been, not been forgiven of a lot, it's just we don't have a revelation of how much we've been forgiven. You know, the, that parable he told that, you know, the woman who was breaking the alabaster box, she was breaking that which was most precious to her and pouring her heart and her very life out to Christ. She used her hair, she humbled herself to washing her hair, washing his feet with her hair and drying it with her, you know, washing it with her tears and drying it with her hair because her love for Christ was enough because she had a revelation of who she was without Christ. That's why you have some people who come from doing all kinds of wicked things, and their heart is broken, and they give Christ everything. It's not that they were all oh, such great sinners, and they were sinners, but because they had a revelation of who they were without Christ. They saw how far they could be without Christ, and they saw what Christ forgave them with. They saw their unworthiness, and they loved Christ so greatly that they poured their life out. And the people in the church who've been raised about God, who've been knowing the truth, we can have that same heart. We just got to come to the end of ourselves, just like do, did, do. By crying out and seeking the Lord, by meditating on his word, saying, Lord, give me a revelation of the cross. Give me a revelation of the price you paid. You know that song, lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees where I lay me down. Show me your heart, O Lord. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to come to the end of ourselves. We're supposed to lay, say, Lord, let me be poured out because you poured out all that you are, that I may love you as you love me. And he says that you may know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge which we can't understand. He says, then, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. He says, if you want to be filled with God, you want the Spirit of God, you want the grace of God, you want the Spirit of God, you want the power of God, you want to lay hands on the sick and they will recover, you want all these things. But what will give it to you? What, I mean, what is the true thing we're supposed to be seeking? We're supposed to be seeking to love Christ with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbors ourselves. We're supposed to be trying to abide in him and him abide in us, abide in him and his word abide in us. We're supposed to be pouring ourselves out, crying and seeking with all we are, that we may see his heart, that we may see his mind. If you love what Christ loved, then you'll see somebody sick and you'll lay hands on them and they'll recover. You'll know his word and it says that these signs will fall them that believe. You know, you'll see what Christ is and you'll say, Lord, you did it. Now I want to do the same that I may bring honor and glory to your name that they may see you and be set free. That's why the disciples said, Lord, we pray that mighty signs and wonders may be done by your apostles and your disciples and your people's hands. Why? That they may see you, that your name may be glorified, that they may see the truth, that they may be healed, saved, and delivered, that they may come to a knowledge of you, Jesus Christ. And that's what healing, that's what deliverance is from, that's what all these things are for, that they may see Christ. So we're, if you're seeking healing, you're see, I mean, for yourself, God will heal you. But if you're seeking, you know, to lay hands on the sick, seek Christ. Don't seek anything else. Seek Christ. Don't seek 
I've heard people say, don't seek his hands, don't seek his feet, seek his face. Say it this way, seek his heart. Seek what he loves, what he cares for, what he desires. Don't seek a part of the word. Don't seek a part of God. Seek God. Seek him with all you heart, that you may live and move and have your being with him, that yes, these signs will follow those who believe. That's because it's a sign that you are in him and he's in you and that he's, you know, you're living together. You're a couple because he, you're now one. There isn't a separation. That's why he says there's neither bond nor symbionts. You know, there's bond or free or male or female or any of this stuff because we're all in Christ and Christ is in us and that's where we're supposed to be living. And that's why they can look at the early church and say, Christians, Christ-like. He says, we can see Christ. Christ is shining out of their heart, shining out of their face, shining out of their words, shining out of their deeds. And that's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be living in Christ and Christ is supposed to be living in us. He says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. He says, God is able to do more than we could even think or ask or desire or even imagine by the power that works in us. And what is that power? He says, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, amen. The glory of God by Jesus Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Greater is he that's in you. Christ is the power that's working in you. Christ is the one who sets you free from sin. Christ is the one, by his word, the word made flesh, purifying, washing us. He says, Jesus loved his church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify it, that he might heal it and deliver it and set it free and cleanse it from that which is wrong by the washing of the water by the word, by his word, by his life in his word. He might cleanse us and wash us and set us free. Colossians 1, 26 or 27 says, Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made revealed to its saints. You know, it talks about in Hebrews, it says, these people, the people in the Old Testament, they saw Christ, and they were like, Lord, Jesus is going to die for us. He's going to be resurrected for us. He's going to save us. He's going to heal us. They had such a heart after God that God was able to reveal them Christ even before Christ was born upon the earth and died for us. And they were hungry and they were seeking Christ. And that's what they were living for. That's why they could do such great, mighty signs and wonders. That's why they could be used of God so wonderfully in the Old Testament. That's why it was Christ. We don't realize it sometimes. We wonder why were they able, because it was Christ. And that's why the new and the old are one, in the sense because it's all in Christ. And that's why all the Levitical laws, in the sense of noon days, feast days, and all these things don't mean anything anymore, because they were an example of Christ. Everything was in Christ. By Christ was all things created. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word's with God, and the Word's with God. All things were made by Him. All things were made by Christ. All things were revealed by Christ. All things were written by Christ. The Word is Christ. Christ is his word. Christ was, an, was the sign of the word living and moving and having his being in the physical world. And now he wants to live, move, and have his being in you. And he says, to whom God would make known what is the riches, the bountifulness of this glory, of this awesome, of this beauty, of this mystery among the Gentiles, among everyone, which is Jesus Christ in you, living abiding, remaining, dwelling, possessed to where nothing, you know, to where we are rooted and grounded in loving him, where he's rooted and grounded in us, where Christ is our life, to where we can't be shaken, we cannot be tossed. We are like a tree planted by his rivers of living water that we will bring forth his nature. It says, exceeding great and precious promises where we might, we might be just like Christ, partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption, the destruction of sin, which is in this world. Corruption, you know, and he says, the hope of glory. He says, 1 John 4, 4, he says, you are of God, little children. He says, you are dwelling in him and Christ is dwelling in you, little children. And you have overcome all this world. You've overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Because Christ dwells in you and you dwell in him, he's greater in you and nothing else can harm you. That's why Jesus says, you know, everything is put under his feet and he's supposed to be our head. And when Christ is our head, everything's under his feet, and we are the fullness of him, which is the fill, who fills all in all. Christ is everything, but he wants to be everything in us. 
He wants us to be everything in him in the sense that where nothing can affect us, nothing can annihilate us, nothing can destroy us because we are more than a conqueror through whom he loved us and gave himself for us to where we live, move, and have our being to him where he is our breath, our hope, our joy, our song, our meditation, our delight, our life is in him. John 15, 1 through 16 says, I am the true vine. And my father is the husband. He says, I am what life springs forth. I am where all life dwells. And he says, and my father is the one who tries to cleanse you and purify you to where things won't take a hold of you and leech the life out of you, that leech that will kill you. And he says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He says, if a branch says they're in me and they're not producing my nature, my character, not at all, he says, Christ will take them, God will take them away. And that's why he says, be, you know, that's why he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He says, that's why consider yourself, lest you be in the faith. And he says, in every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it bring, bring forth more fruit. He says that it may be more like Christ. And he says, now you are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. He says, I'm going to purify you, I'm going to cleanse you, I'm going to wash you, I'm going to set you free by my blood and by my word. And he says, Abide in me, live, dwell, remain in me, and I live, dwell, and remain in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. He says, a branch doesn't come from anything else but the vine. But if the branch is broken off of the vine, it's dead, it's gone, it has no life in it. And that's who you are. You were dead without Christ, and now Christ gave you life, and with him you have life. But if you're broken off from him, if you're not seeking him, if you're not desiring him, if you're out doing your own thing, if you're not gathering yourself together with the saints, even more so as you see the day approaching, you will shrivel up and you die. Because Christ, he says, you know, we are the fullness of him who fills all. We're all part of his body. We're supposed to be one with Christ and one with each other. And he says, we have no life in ourselves. He says, I am the vine. I am what life comes from. I am your life. Ye are the branches. He says, yes, you're a part of me. Yes, you can produce fruit. Yes, you can produce something that is beautiful. But he says, we're one without me. He says, I gave you life. I created you. I bought you with my blood. I set you free. I gave you a new creature, a new person in me. But he says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me liveth in me, and I live in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. He says, you will be battleful. You will, you will have great, li great life. You will have awesome things that happen. He says, you will have his kindness, his gentleness. He says, you can't even imagine what Christ can do through you. He says, for, what, he says, for without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, live not in me, eat not in me, breathe not in me, drink not in me, think about me, honor not in me. He says he is cast forth as a branch. He's already been cut off and he's cast forth. He says it is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. He says you will be burned with other things if you don't abide in me. He says because when you're, when you're one with me, then you're a part of me. But when you, when you separate yourself, Christ doesn't separate himself from us. He never leaves us nor forsake us. We separate ourselves by our thoughts, by our desires, by what we want, by what we do. And he says, if you already separate yourself as a branch, then you'll become cast aside. The devil, the world, people will burn you with hellish fires, and you'll be consumed. And he says, if you abide in me, and what I say, and whom I am, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. If you abide in him, and he abides in you, and his word lives and moves and has and breathes in you, then you'll be able to ask what you will, because then you'll ask for what you should. He says, the adulterous, the adulterous says, know ye not the friendship with the world is enmity of God? He says, you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. He says, we are supposed to have the heart and mind of God to where, just like Christ did, we ask for the souls of men, where we ask that we may do his Father's will, that we may ask that we may see the heart and the will of the Father brought forth upon this life. And he says, that's why the Lord says, this is the prayer of thy Father which art in heaven, hallowed, honored, and glory be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy righteousness, thy peace, thy joy, thy nature come. Thy will be done on earth, in me, and in others as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, you provide what we need. Forgive us when we sin. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, for thine is my life, and the glory, and all I glory, and all I rejoice, and all I hope for, and all I live for, and the power, all that gives me strength. 
forever and ever, amen. And that's why Jesus said the Lord's Prayer. And that is supposed to be the center of the very life. Hallowed, glory to the Father. We live in your will. You are our life. You are our hope. And we want to see others, people, see you and live in you. And he says, he says, as the Father has loved me, he says, no, he says, herein is my Father glorified. This brings my Father pleasure. This brings my Father glory. He says, fear not, little flock. It's my Father's good pleasure to give you all that I have, to give you the kingdom. He says that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. He says that love to where the Father and me loved each other and we, we, we were one in our desires. He says, I have given you the same love. But he says, you've got to remain in that love. How do you have the same thoughts and the same desires of Christ? How do you remain in his love? He says... If you keep my commandments, if you keep my word in your heart, in your mind, in your tongue, in your, in your whole emotions, in every area of your life, you shall live and dwell in my love, even as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The word is Christ's desires, his hopes, his dreams, his pleasure, what he loves. And that's, what, and that's the Father's pleasures because he says, me and my Father are one. And he says, I want you to have the same heart. He says, that's why you've got to hide my word in my, your heart. That's why you've got to eat it, drink it. That's why you've got to not let it depart from your eyes. That's why you've got to hide it in the midst of your heart. He says, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full, that your joy in knowing Christ, your joy in living and moving and having your being in Christ, your life, your abundant life, your, your fire, your passion, your hope, your joy may remain in you because I remain in you, because my word remains in you, because I live in you and you live in me. And he says, and this is why you have joy. This is why you have peace. And he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. He says, These, they, I command you to live in me and I to live in you, that you may be able to love one another, that you will love one another. He says, greater love had no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. He says, I lay my life down for my friends. And he says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. If you follow me in doing that which is right, if you follow me to where you can heal and deliver other people, he says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. He he says, I am your friend. He says, I am your king. I am your Lord. And what I command you will help you, will deliver you, will set you free, will lead you and guide you. Therefore, because it is true, because it is that which is right, he says, you need to follow it. And he says, if you don't, then you're like a, you're like a rebellious kid who runs down the road and is going to get smattered by an 18-wheeler. You're like a person who will not follow the laws of the land, who will kill or rape, who will murder, who will do wickedness. And he says, I can't be a friend of that. I can't be a friend of this sin called sin that will destroy you. He says, if you follow me, if you love me, if you obey me, if you keep my word, then are you my friends. And he says, he says, henceforth, from here on out, I will not call you a servant. For a servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you my friends. For all things I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. He says, I give you my word, and that's why you are my friend, because I've given you the truth, because I've revealed the mystery, which is you living in me and me living in you, which is us becoming one, which is us becoming the best of friends, the best of fr buddies, a husband and wife, to where there is no separation between us. And he says, you know, abolishing his flesh, the enmity, the sin that keeps us from God, to where we can now become one with God and God become one with us. And he says, he says, I have made known all these things unto you. He says, you didn't choose me. He says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. He says, you were a mess, you were destroyed. You said, you couldn't even choose me. But I proved my love by reaching forth into this thing corrupted by sin who was hateful, angry, and bitter, and who nobody would want to know. And he says, and I chose you. I called you. And he says, I ordained you. I anointed you. I enabled you. I gifted you. I gave you myself that you might bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that you may have my nature, my character, and that it will remain, that your love, my love will remain, my hope will remain, my joy will remain, my life will remain. And he says, that whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And he says, that I may be your life, and that I may live in you, and you may live in me, and that you will ask, and you'll get everything you ask for. And that's why it says, be, you know, say unto the mountain, be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. Or say he will live and have faith in God and faith in the dwelling in him. And he won't even doubt because Christ is his life. And he has a heart of God and the heart of God is in him. And he says, Father, this needs to be done. Therefore, this mountain is in the way. It needs to be cast down and cast into the sea. 
That's why you can say, be healed in Jesus' name, and they'll be healed. That's why you can say, lay hands on, the, the, you know, on people who have demons, and they'll come screaming out. It's, not, so, it's because Christ is living in you, and, and Christ is living in you. And you are so one that it's Christ reaching forth, Christ healing, Christ delivering, Christ calling forth. Christ is our life, and we are supposed to live in him. That is who we are. We're Christians, Christ-like, Christ-living, Christ-breathing, Christ-eating, Christ-drinking, Christ-living in us. We are supposed to be one with him, even as he is one. That is the love, that is the grace, that is the life that Christ has called for. A great hope, a great grace, a great life in Jesus Christ. Not in the world, not in money, not in prosperity, not in things that don't matter, not in the things that the world are caught up. He says, he says you are not of this world, but I've called you out of the world. He says, that's why the world might hate your guts. Because, he says, they're blind, they're, they're, they bought a lie, they're, they're locked by the devil. And he says, but we want to reach forth, we want to set them free, that they might be set free from living for things that don't matter. You know, God laid up the Garden of Eden to where God provided all they needed. And all they had to do was be fruitful and multiply. All they had to do was have families. All they had to do was give life unto others. All they had to do was rejoice him, delight in him, walk and talk and move and have their being in him. They actually physically walk with God and Jesus in the flesh, in the earth. And that's what Christ wants to do. He wants to live, move. He wants to walk beside you and in you. He wants to become one with you. He wants you to be fruitful and multiply. He wants you to have dominion over the earth. And in other words, to, to take authority over that which shouldn't be there. That's what Christ wants us to do. That's what God called us to do. And that's what Christ came to do. To where we live in him and he lives in us. Christ is your life. Don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let the world lie to you. Don't let the flesh lie to you. Don't buy anything else but Jesus Christ. Because he bought you with his blood. He says, don't treat the blood of Christ unworthily. Don't treat it. He says, don't forget that you were bought with the precious blood of Christ from sin, from fear, from doubt, from worry, from anxiety, from the things of this world. Don't forget that you were bought and set free by Jesus Christ, by his blood. Don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let him give you that which God has set you free from. You don't want poison. You don't want destruction. You don't want hate. You don't want bitterness. You don't want lust. You don't want carnality. You don't want the world. You don't want money for money's sake. You don't want the things of this world. You want Jesus Christ. And that's what Christ has set us. That's what Christ came to do to set us free to where we can be one with him, to where we can be a family, to where we can be, where we can have a newness of life, to where he can be all or all in all. And he can, you know, that's why he says he will not, keep back anything from us because he loves us and he, 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 he's happy with us. He's thrilled with us. He, you know, it's like a, a loving husband and wife where they can't help but want to please each other. They can't help but want to give each other everything. They can't help but want to give each other gifts. And that's what Christ has called us for. A one is to him to where we love each other. We give each other everything we are. And then we give others the truth that they might have that same relationship. So I'm going to end in a word of prayer and say, Father... You've spoken the word. You've spoken your truth. You've given us your life. You've given us your blood. You've given us your newness of life. Lord, show us. Open our eyes. Open our heart. Open our mind. Let us see your love that we may love you in return. That we may show your love to others. That we may not live for a life that's going to be here and then it's gone. The vapor that is here and it's gone. The things of this world don't matter. But we will live for what is important that we will be the light and sod of the world, that people will see you because we see you, because we live in you and you abide in us, that we can show you to others, Lord. This is what we ask for. This is what we pray for, Lord, that you may live, move, and have your being in us, and that you may live and move and have your being in others. And this we pray in Jesus' name.